Hi, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate our electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. First, we're going to get some of our acids together. We're going to need seven milliliters of sulfuric acid in one step and then three mils in a second step. So since I have the advantage of having as many graduated cylinders as I want, I'm going to go ahead and get those ready to go. These acids are in the hoods. I'm also going to get three mils of nitric acid and have that ready to go. When you get the lid off an acid bottle, don't forget to always hold it in your hand, never put it on the counter. I'm going to go ahead and measure these out and I'll be back with you. I wanted seven milliliters, so I poured close to the seven and then I'm going to take the transfer pipette. I'm going to read this at eye level and I'm going to add carefully dropwise to the bottom of the, of the meniscus is exactly at seven. Okay, now I have measured out my acids. I'm gonna go ahead and the directions say to go ahead and add seven mils of sulfuric acid to a 125 mil Erlenmeyer flask. So right now there's nothing else in this flask with it. It's just the sulfuric acid. And I have it in an ice bath, which is about three fourths ice and one fourth water. That'll make it nice and cold. I'm gonna swirl it just a little bit so it gets exposed and it can be nice and cold. This reaction is an exothermic reaction, so it'll give off a lot of energy and heat, and we don't want that to happen, so we're gonna do this part of the reaction when we mix our acids in an ice bath. Now in a separate flask, I'm gonna mix three mils of concentrated sulfuric acid with three mils of concentrated nitric acid, and I'm gonna cool that in a separate flask, but in the same ice bath. So now that I have my seven mils of sulfuric acid nice and cold, I'm gonna add dropwise my methyl benzoate. I noticed when I open the bottle and dispense it, it has kind of an interesting odor, maybe a little bit of wintergreen. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this slowly dropwise. I had to put it in a small beaker because my transfer pipette did not fit in my 10 mil graduated cylinder. So I'm gonna slowly add this dropwise with swirling. And because it's an exothermic reaction, you need to swirl it and keep it in the ice bath. You wanna make sure this reaction comes to completion. You wanna slow it down a bit. So I'll be continuing to add this dropwise with swirling while it's in the ice bath, and then I'll get back to you. So I've added all the methyl benzoate. I did notice there's a slight yellow tinge to my solution, so I might want to note that. I'm going to cool this, and I'm also going to cool in a separate flask my three mils of sulfuric acid and three mils of nitric acid. So I'm now adding my nitric acid and sulfuric acid dropwise. I'm keeping my flask inside the ice bath because it's heating up quite a bit. I'm going to add just a few drops at a time and swirl. So now I'm going to measure out 30 grams of ice in a 150 ml beaker. And as you can see, I've got my ice and my scale here. I'm going to go ahead and tear out the weight of the beaker by pressing tear. So that zeroed out for me and I'm going to go ahead and add ice, 30 grams. There's my 30 grams of ice. All right, it's been about 10 minutes. It's definitely been to room temperature. Still note that we have the amber color going on. I have my 30 grams of crushed ice right here. I'm gonna go ahead and add this to the crushed ice. You see the steam coming off of that? The reason why we use ice and not just water is because it's going to get hot and exothermic. And now you can see I have a cloudy solution. Those are my crystals. So we're successful in this. We are able to make the crystals. Our next step is to recrystallize these because these are crude crystals and we need to make them nice and clean and pure so we can take a melting point. So you can see now I do have my solid and the amber color is gone so it didn't make any difference that that was there. Next, I'm gonna use my Buchner funnel to go ahead and filter the crude crystals. Keep in mind when you use a Buchner funnel, you lay the paper on flat, you put a little water in there so it stays nice and flat. And then because we're doing this filtration with cold methanol and cold water, I'm gonna go ahead and pre-treat this with a little bit of cold water first. That way, 
I don't accidentally, with it being too warm, make these crystals go out of solution. So when I'm putting a Buchner funnel into the filter flask, I need to get the rubber stopper wet a little bit, push down on the rubber stopper, and then go ahead and attach it to have the vacuum go. So the vacuums aren't on, so I'm gonna to have to use the aspirator. It's gonna be kind of loud, so I'm not gonna go ahead and tape during that. But just know what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be taking these solids. I'm actually gonna pour the liquid in first, as much as I can, into my filter flask here, into my Buchner funnel, and collect the crude crystals. So here's the setup. I'm gonna go ahead and pour in my liquid as much as I can that keeps it from clogging it up and then get the solid in there. And I will be drying my crude crystals. I'll be taking a, a I'm gonna take a glass rod and get the rest of this out. So I have a little bit of solid left in my beaker so I'm going to go ahead and rinse with a little bit of cold water to get all of it into that Buchner funnel so I can get a better percent yield. So one of the first things I want to do with my crystals is I need to wash them because they still have that acid on them and I'm going to wash them with cold water. So in my ice bath I've actually had to put ice in different more ice in it during these experiment, this experiment and I have my water here and I have my five mil portions of methanol ready to go here. They all need to be cold. So I'm gonna go ahead and rinse. And this is called washing the precipitate. I'm going to make sure I get water on all of this because I want the acid that's stuck on that precipitate to be washed off. So I'm gonna do this about three times. You can see I'm putting just enough in to get it wet and letting the filter do its work. And one more time, this should probably do it pretty well. So that's called washing the precipitate. So the next step is for me to wash it with two five milliliter portions of methanol. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put in my methanol. There's my two five milliliter portions. And if you notice, I'm doing this outside the hood. I did all the acid part of the experiment in the hood, but I can go ahead and do this outside of the hood now because this is all neutralized. All right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take my crystals out of here. I'm gonna put them in a 125 mil Erlenmeyer flask with five mils of methanol, and then I'll be putting it on the hot plate and I'll see you in a bit. Oh, don't forget, I'm gonna put in a couple boiling chips. So to get all of the solid out, I'm gonna have to use a rubber policeman. And let me get all the solid out of here and put it in here. And I'll be back with you. So we're back on the hood again. We want to go ahead and have the hood take away the meth methanol vapor that releases. I'm going to be heating this until all the solid dissolves. That's what recrystallization is, is you bring it back into the dissolved state. And those crystals, impurities that got caught within our crystals are supposed to release and then we're gonna crystallize it a second time. That's why it's called recrystallization. And that will be a much more pure compound. So it's possible I have to bring this to a boil. It's possible I might have to add a little bit more methanol to make sure everything dissolves, but I don't wanna to add too much. So I've got my methanol ready and I'll get back with you in a minute. So I'm on the recrystallization step. I have now put this back in the hood because I want to make sure any fumes that are given off are captured by the hood. So it looks like I have my two boiling stones in there. I was able to dissolve all the crystals. The idea behind recrystallization is you take those crude crystals, you put them back into solution and any impurities that happen to be trapped in the original crude crystals are now gone from that. So when I take this and I make them crystals again, hopefully what we're gonna see are nice pure crystals and we're gonna prove it by taking the melting point a good demonstration of how a boiling stone works. The only two solids in there right now are the boiling stones and you can see that it gives you a nice smooth boil. All right, I'm gonna let it come to room temperature before I put it in the ice bath. Well, this is what happens after I let it go to room temperature. These nice needle-like crystal form before they were kind of clumpy crystals. And this is showing me that we have a more pure crystal that was formed because I let the flask be undisturbed for a while. 
So now I went ahead and put in an ice bath and we'll see if any more crystals form. We're gonna go ahead and use that Buchner funnel again and collect these crystals. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the weight of my filter paper now. I'm using the analytical balance so we can get a few more digits. So go ahead and record this number in your report. Looks like we got a few more crystals. I'm going to be removing the boiling chips before I put it in the funnel. All right, this is my pre-weighed filter paper. I'm going to go ahead and wet it down so it stays down. And because the last thing I had on there was methanol, I'm going to go ahead and pre-rinse it with a little bit of methanol. So to get the rest of this out, I'm going to add a little bit of cold methanol because I don't want it to go back and dissolve. Go ahead and put that in there and I'm going to go ahead and let this dry. So now that we have our beautiful crystals, there's two more things I need to do. I need to go ahead and weigh the crystals on the weigh paper and then subtract the weight of the weigh paper and I could figure out my percent yield. And then I'm also going to take the pure crust crystals and do a melting point and see if I really did do a nitration electrophilic aromatic substitution. So I'm going to go ahead and zero out, tear out the watch glass. That way I can go ahead and put my filter paper with crystals on there and I won't get the pan messy. So I'll go ahead and stop this and then give you your mess. Okay, remember I went ahead and teared out the watch glass first. So what it's weighing is only the mass of the filter paper and the crystals. You're gonna take this mass and put it on your report on the part that says mass of recrystallized product and filter paper. Okay, for your report sheet, remember these first two numbers here came from an analytical balance. Those were our exper experimental results. So we have a lot more sig figs we get to use here for the massive purified product and that won't limit our sig figs too much because we actually have five of them there. Don't forget when you fill in the table, you actually used a total of 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid. It was two different steps. One time you did three mils, the other time was seven mils and converting those to liters. And the mass of the methyl benzoate is actually from the instructions. We measured the volume, but I gave you the mass. To calculate the moles here, you're gonna calculate the moles of your nitric acid here. This is the formula the moles of sulfuric acid here. And then because we have a mass, our benz methyl benzoate is gonna be using this formula to figure out the moles. We're gonna compare them using the mole ratio too and find out which one is the lowest number. So on this table here, on this column, whichever is the lowest number, then what's gonna happen is that will be your limiting reagent. And I ask you for the limiting reagent. That means I want the name of the limiting reagent here. In this calculation here, you'll also see this calculation posted on Canvas for you, but you're gonna go ahead and calculate from the mole of the limiting reagent, you're gonna to go to mole of product and gram of product, so this would then be your theoretical yield. Be sure to show me all the math and all the units here. Then this experimental mass is the mass I got from up here. The theoretical goes down here times 100, and that will give you your percent. And then don't forget to answer the rest of this question here. There are no more questions on the back. We're going to go ahead and take the melting point of our product here. I'm going to be using the DigiMelt apparatus. I started it at 60 degrees and I have the ramp rate at 2 degrees per minute. What's going to happen is I'm going to get the melting point range and I'll be giving that to you. The technique I used is exactly the same technique we used in experiment one and I'll come back with you with our range. I'm going to try to keep my hands steady here for you. We're getting closer to the melting point. See a little bit of movement on the one on the right and it looks like it might be starting but not quite yet. Well, it looks like something's starting on the right. I can, oh, there it is. It's starting there. I see melting, I see a little bit of movement. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and record that number. I press the button. Ooh, the one on the left 
the smaller sample size look like. It's almost done. One on the left is just about done. I'm going to go ahead and call it. And the one on the right, because I have such a large sample size, is taking much longer. They both started about the same time. Not quite. I see some solid in there still. There we go. Okay, because I did two different samples, I actually have two different data, and I'm going to tell you why I want to use which one. The smaller size sample, which is probably a little more accurate in the size we're supposed to use, had a melting point range of 76.0 to 76.6 degrees. That is an amazingly sharp melting point. That indicates we have a very pure crystal. That's something when we mention our melting point and our conclusion, you need to also mention the purity of the sample. Now the larger size sample, I did get a pretty sharp melting point. I have a difference though of about one point, what's that, 1.4 degrees. It's still a good sharp melting point, but that shows you that when you have a larger sample, it just definitely takes a little longer to melt and the temperature was able to rise. So which one do I want you to use? I love the better data here. Use the small one at 76.0 through 76.6 degrees C. That's the one you're also gonna put in your conclusion.